Hello and welcome everyone um, to this webinar that we're holding uh, from IEA headquarters in, in Paris um, on recycling of critical minerals. I can see um, attendees coming in, so we'll give people just a, a second uh, to join us. And as they're doing so, perhaps I can just um, walk us through some um, elements of housekeeping and organization for uh, the day's uh, events. Um, we'll open in a in a second. Um, I'll say a few words and then pass across uh, to our colleague uh, Silvia Santangelo, um, who's the first councillor at the Italian delegation um, to the OECD. And Italy have been great supporters um, of this work uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but also in the context of the uh, presidency of the G7. And then I'm going to pass across to our very capable critical minerals analytical team, which is led by my colleague uh, Taeyun Kim, head of unit. And Taeyun, uh, together with some members of the team, are going to then walk us through some of the findings uh, from this new analysis that was released on Monday. And in case you're not aware, um, this report, uh, like I think all IEA analytical outputs, is free to download from the IEA website. So please, if you haven't done so already, um, take the opportunity uh, to download it from, from, from the website. Um, that presentation is going to last for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have the opportunity to take a few questions uh, from participants. Um, please put questions in at any time um, on the chat function uh, of Zoom. And uh, we will then put as many questions as we can to um, our esteemed presenters um, before we go across to uh, a wonderful panel discussion. Um, I won't introduce the panelists because I think Taeyun will moderate that section and he will um, introduce them um, himself. But there would also be a discussion, uh, a possibility during that part of the um, during that part of the webinar to ask questions. So please, um, as and when things occur to you. Uh, feel free to put things on chat, uh, and we will get through as many of those questions as we can, both on the presentation, um, but also with uh, our, our panelists. I don't think I introduced myself. I'm Tim Gould. I'm the IEA's Chief Energy Economist, and I had the great pleasure to oversee this area of, uh, of, of work um, within the IEA. Um, why have we arrived at this topic? I think... Um, the broad contours will be familiar to, to I think, everyone on the, um, on the webinar today. Uh, you know, as we move towards a more electrified, renewables-rich system, some important new resource issues come into play. Um, and we at the IEA have a energy security at the heart of our mandate. Um, and early on, in energy transitions, we started to look more at some of these mineral resource issues. Uh, and that led, in particular in 2021, to a landmark report where we set out the landscape as we saw it for the role of critical minerals in, in clean energy and transitions. And because there are new dependencies, new energy security issues uh, involved, um, this quickly became a, a very strong area of IEA activity, and we developed a new work stream with the strong support uh, of our member countries um, to look both at the analytical components of this, but also at the possibilities for uh, countries to collaborate on some of the security issues. So we now have a voluntary critical minerals security program, which looks at how countries can work together in order to mitigate some uh, of the vulnerabilities um, that, uh, that we see in the system and to ensure that critical minerals uh, play their part in the transition to a safer and more sustainable system. Now, some see parallels between the work that we do on critical minerals and the existing work program and the existing security mechanisms um, that we have uh, for, for fossil fuels and indeed, there are some broad similarities, but there are some very important differences um, uh, as well. So fossil fuels, as we all are aware, um, you consume them and you're left with the energy service, but you're also left uh, with the emissions. Um, and that is, in a sense, a recurring operational expenditure for the energy system. 
Critical minerals play a very different function in the energy system. They're built into the infrastructure that we have. Um, they're built into the new technologies that we will need for um, a different kind uh, of energy system. Um, but a really crucial difference there is that we can use them and we can reuse them. Um, and that is a very important source of secondary supply um, that as demand for these critical minerals increases, we need to have in mind. And that's why um, for us, this recycling component is such an important part of the discussion on critical minerals, on energy transitions and the security and sustainability uh, of those processes. I will leave it there for these um, introductory remarks, um, but just to say many, many thanks to this, uh, to Tayun and this extremely talented team, to Amrita who led the work. Um, you'll be hearing from all of those colleagues, um, but thanks also to all of you, and I can see there's many of you um, online today uh, to share uh, in this discussion. And with that, I'm very pleased to pass across uh, to uh, our colleague, um, Silvia Sant'Angelo, uh, from the uh, Italian delegation to the OECD to say uh, some opening remarks. Um, Silvia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tim. And let me start thanking the agency for this work, um, for, its, for having carried out this study, and more generally for its um, leading involvement in the field of critical minerals. This is an absolutely crucial, crucial issue as these materials are, as you said before, an enable for the energy transition and the safety and reliability of their production chains are essential for any energy security of any country. Uh, while we continue to use fossil fuels, we see that the world is starting to demand more and more clean technology. And that means we are slowly, slowly moving from a fossil fuel based economy to an increasingly mineral based one. The example of means of transport is clear. Uh, an electric vehicle requires six times the amount of critical minerals um, compared to the traditional car. This means that the dependence of these technologies from critical minerals is becoming more and more important. At national level, in line with a technology neutral approach to the energy transition, Italy has started to define its national strategy in this field through the establishment of a national platform on critical raw materials. And also in the framework of the Italian G7 presidency, as you were mentioning, we, we have promoted the security of supply of critical raw materials through the concrete implementation of international partnership to strengthen supply chain. In this regard, let me remind the significant commitments enshrined in the G7 Climate, Energy and Environment Ministerial Declaration, also called as the Venaria Charter. We are convinced that the global dimension of critical uh, mineral supply chains needs diplomacy and multilateralism. Uh, as a crucial tool for the realization of an international energy systems that enables the sustainable develop development of these supply chains. The possibility of recycling critical materials and extracting them from hand of life products also open up, open up new opportunities for countries that do not have them on their territory. Indeed, recycling and reuse uh, provide a valuable source of secondary supply that reduces dependence and improves security of supply for importer countries as Italy is. And it is important to remember how recycling such minerals also affects prices and costs, bearing in mind that according to the EA analysis, without recycling and reuse, capital required for mining would be 30% higher. For all these reasons, it is necessary for governments to ensure a regulatory system that encourages and accelerates the recycling of these minerals. Private sector involvement is also essential to maximize the benefits of recycling process. As the year show, report shows, metal recovery from e-waste needs much more attention from industry and policymakers as well, and battery recycling 
is the key to boosting overall mineral recycling rates. In Italy, thanks to the work of ASSO Resource, a critical raw material task force has been established, which includes companies from the energy and mining supply chain, sharing expertise and know-how needed to identify best practices that can be developed in Italy and replicated around the world. Uh, you may know many of these companies, including Cyprem, Mineral Industriali, and, and many others. I will not, um, I will not mention all of them. Um, let me conclude saying that the EA Works is therefore crucial for us to ensuring the development of sustainable production chains that can provide necessary support for the energy transition. And we welcome once again this first of its kind report on critical minerals recycling that presents key policy recommendations to accelerate the uptake of recycling practices. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Sylvia, for these um, introductory words. And um, indeed, as you mentioned just now, this is a, a first of a kind a report. Um, we think that it, it does break new ground um, in the coverage uh, of this issue and the depth of the analysis. And to help us understand um, why and how, I'm going to pass the floor across now to Tayun and colleagues uh, to walk us through uh, some of the key findings. Um, and then reminder, if you have questions as we go along, uh, please don't hesitate to put them into the chat function um, and we'll get to those once we've heard from Tayun and colleagues. Thank you, Tim. It's great pleasure to introduce the key findings of our latest report on this critical mineral recycling. So over the next some 20 minutes, we will go through some of the key findings from the report. And But at the IEA, we have been the, continuing to strengthen our analytical effort to, to monitor the market situation and making some projections for future demand and supply to understand where the industry is standing today and also where it is heading in terms of supply demand balances, also the level of the production concentrations. And this, the analysis we did in the, our latest Global Critical Minutes Outlook 2024 in May, and we look at the how demand and supply balances for these materials may look like in 2035 in our announced pledge scenario, which is a scenario that reflects the country's national the climate pledges. And situation varies depending on the minerals you're talking about. So some materials face some supply volume risks and other materials face some big supply concentration risks. For in the case of the copper and lithium, the, we feel the, we think expected supply from announced project falls short of what is required in this scenario in 2035. And in the case of nickel and cobalt, the situation is, looks relatively better, but still there are some more ways to go. And in the case of graphite and rare earth element, these materials may not face the supply volume risks, but these two are very much an issue in terms of high level of ge ge geographical concentrated productions. So some materials face supply volume risk and some materials face supply chain concentration risks. But when it comes to the, there are some gaps in the supply, the demand balances, and these can be potentially closed by scaling of investment in new mines, new refineries and new smelters, which is absolutely essential. But we also think there are some ample scope for demand side actions through technology innovation and behavioral changes, and most importantly, recycling. So this is the motivation for us to look at this topic in depth in this special report of how to what extent recycling can play a role in addressing these critical mineral challenges and what kind of policy actions can stimulate and scale up the help scale up these recycling volumes. So, but if you look at the historical, the performance of recycling in the past decade, the in general recycled material use has struggling to keep pace with rising the material demand. In the case of copper, the share of recycling in total demand was declined from 77% to almost 33% in recent years. And also in the case of nickel, the same happened. The, the share of recycling declined from 35% to almost 25% in 2023. But there are some also some optimistic sign in the case of battery metals such as cobalt and lithium. So in, you can see from the chart and there are some recent uptick in the performance of recycling in, in recent 
two, three years. And we still remains to be seen how this momentum maintained after 24, but the, this highlights some, some mixed picture for recycling performance, depending on the minerals you're talking about. But in general, we think there are some more opportunity to step up the performance of recycling in, in, in this space. Another issue when you look at the historical the performance of recycling, one major issue is about very high level of disparity between the regions, especially between advanced economies and developing economies. When you look at the e-waste as an example, the collection rate in the developing economies in Africa, the developing Asia, and also Latin America, the ratio stand below the 5%. And, and in some cases, just 1%. And we didn't see that much improvement in, in the past decade. But this contrasts with some high level of the collection rate in other regions, such as the 30% for Japan and Korea, and almost 40 to 50% for the North America and Europe. So this highlights some importance of the stepping up effort on the building some strengthening recycling infrastructure and strengthening policies in these developing economies. And the same the situation also applies to some bulk materials such as aluminum and, and the copper. In the case of aluminum, the recycling rate is just the sitting around 30% in developing economies in general, but this same figure is almost 80% for the US. And as you can see from the right end of the chart, and in the case of copper, secondary copper supply, and it is mainly almost 90% is coming from advanced economies and in China, and there are some very little amount of volumes being supplied through, through developing economies. And these two highlight some importance of the stepping up effort in the <laughs> improving performance in developing economies in, in specifics. And I mentioned about some stagnating performance of recycling in the past, and also some, some limited improvement and limited performance in developing economies, but we also, there are some, the, some aspect element that can be make us a bit more optimistic in the future. So future may be a bit different than what we saw in the past because what we are seeing in the marketplace is the clean energy transition is happening much faster than people generally have expected. That means from around 2030, there'll be some influx of the recyclable feedstocks available and especially from 2035 onward as EVs and solar panels reach their end of life. So you can see from the chart, this is the Cape of Copper, and which is already the recycled in a bulk, the, in a large amount, but also we see some, some substantial potential for copper recycling to step up as we see more the recyclable system become available in the marketplace. But essentially these batteries and solar PV, and you can clearly see some very exponential growth expected after 2035, and as these materials they reach the end of life. So this is how we can the tap this potential, unlock this potential through policies and investment is very much essential to the underpins, the performance of recycling. But if we are successful in scaling recycling, this can reduce the, have, have reduced mining need by some 25 to 40%, depending on the materials we are talking about. So in the case of copper, around 40%, and in the case of lithium and nickel, it's around 20 to 25%. And again, for cobalt is 40%. And this reduces some huge burden to mobilize the big amount of capital to support the undeveloped mining project. But also there are some important security benefits, especially for the countries with importing these materials from outside. The countries with some limited resource endowment and also the greater the clean tech deployment. For example, in the case of lithium and nickel, and you see some 20 to 25% of this the share by 2040 and 2050. But in the, in the case of Europe, for example, this is a lot higher above 30% in our projections. So this security benefit can be far greater in regions with some the import dependent on this the minerals. And the scaling of recycling can also bring some quite substantial the financial and sustainability benefits. In the case of the mining investment need in our announced project scenario, we estimate around 600 billion of investment in mining would be required through to 2040 to support the, <coughs> the, <coughs> the level of demand projected. But without the uptake of recycling from today's level, and this amount of investment would have been 30% higher. And this raised the, the burden to mobilize some large scale financing, the making this 
the financial challenges even even further. And also the there are some some important the emission and environmental and social benefits. And in, in on average, the recycled materials, energy changing minerals, and from cobalt, lithium, nickel, copper, incur 80% the less emissions than, than primary materials from mining. So this incurs some cumulative, sizable the cumulative reduction of emissions to for the supply of these battery metals. And this also, these materials use a lot less water than the primary materials. So this is one, one important benefit that recycling can bring. But also wanted to highlight the, I talk about this investment need, reduced investment need for mining, but also need to highlight the investment in new mines and, and new smelters and new refineries is still essential because the, the level of demand projected in the mid century is still higher than today's production levels. And also existing mines, they face some natural decline in output over time. So due to these two regions, still we believe investment in new mines and new refineries is very much essential, but the scale of recycling can help reduce these burdens to develop some, some more the larger number of mines. And also one another caveat I want to highlight is that the I talk about this the recycled materials on average in general incur less environmental and social impact, but they are not free from the environmental impact entirely. And for example, in the case of batteries and poorly managed battery supply chain can incur some, some the huge environmental impacts from waste residues and water contaminant and, and harmful emissions. So some data reason to strengthen, the, especially for standard for the recycling the, to mitigate any impact of this, the environmental and social impact of recycling. So there are some many standards emerging in the marketplace for mining and in some cases refining processing, but we believe there are some more stop, the scope to further strengthen effort to the, the <laughs> strengthen and improve the existing standard for the recycling specifically. And in enabling all this one, and there's many things, many tasks to be done, but the battery recycling, one of the key factor the, in enabling all these performance improvements. So I will the, hand over to Shoban to go through some of the key findings of the battery sector. Yeah, so um, good, the good news is that battery recycling, both pre-treatment and material recovery is expanding rapidly. In 2023, both saw an almost 50% year-on-year growth and announced projects indicate some five-fold increase by 2030. However, currently, pretreatment and material recovery capacity is dominated by China, with over 80% of global capacity for both. Europe and North America to collectively hold only 10% of current pretreatment capacity and just 4% of material recovery capacity. Analysis of the project pipeline indicates that China is on track to retain over three quarters of global pretreatment and material recovery capacity by 2030. This means that despite domestic pretreatment capacity being developed in the United States, Europe, and elsewhere, much of the black mass produced from end-of-life batteries will still need to be exported for battery-grade material recovery, thus reducing the supply security benefits of recycling. While diversification has been a key focus in mineral mining and refining, it is equally critical in the minerals recycling sector. Today, Battery recycling capacity is outpacing available feedstock, although the picture varies by region. If all announced projects come online as scheduled, global recycling capacity in 2030 would be notably higher than the amount of available feedstock. However, the picture changes rapidly up to 2030 as EVs reach end of life at scale, and the feedstock availability increases sharply, surpassing announced capacity by 20% by 2040 globally though there are major, major regional differences. China can see, continues to see a significant excess capacity relative to domestic feedstock, even after the rapid increase in EV, EVs reaching end of life. In Europe and the United States, however, excess capacity dissipates up to 2030 and announced capacity covers only 30% of feedstock in both regions in 2040. In India, this is even more stark, where the coverage in 2040 is just 10%. In addition to developing recycling infrastructure, enhancing efforts to boost collection rates is equally critical. Improving the collection of end-of-life clean energy technologies and minimizing waste leakages 
would significantly increase the amount of recoverable critical minerals, offer greater security of supply benefits, and maximize returns on investments in recycling infrastructure. For, for instance, in the case of battery metals such as lithium, nickel, and cobalt, achieving a 90% collection rate by 2040 could enable secondary supply to meet 25 to 35% of total demand of these minerals by 2050. In contrast, lower collection rates would reduce this contribution to just 15 to 20%. A key question in projecting the potential of battery cycling in the future is the future trade patterns of used electric vehicles. Today, significant volumes of used conventional cars are exported from advanced economies to developing economies. It is highly uncertain if this trend will continue with EVs. In the APS, used EVs, if UVEs, used EVs exports mirror the export rates of conventional cars, the available battery feedstock for recycling in advanced economies in China could drop by 25% or one terawatt hour by 2050. While developing economies see a 50% increase in feedstock of 0.5 terawatt hour, this is less than the reduction in advanced economies due to the extended battery lifetimes and delayed battery retirement. Now, this has two significant implications. First, additional recycling capacity will be needed in potentially importing regions, especially for pretreatment facilities to prevent the waste and loss of valuable feedstock for recycling. Otherwise, we may face a reduction of recycled volumes globally. Second, clarity on used EV export rules and conditions is critical to reduce the uncertainties and encourage appropriate recycling investments in both exporting and importing regions. I'm now gonna pass over to Alex to present. Another area. Another area we'd like to highlight is the opportunity uh, to extract value from mine waste to recover valuable resources. Each year, mining generates around 100 billion tons of waste, in addition to the sizable amount that already exists in active, inactive, and closed tailings. This volume is set to increase by almost 90% by 2030 over 2020 levels. The reprocessing of mined waste or tailing can, tailings can reduce waste generation and mitigate environmental impacts, such as water contamination and soil pollution. For closed or abandoned sites, it also presents an opportunity for environmental remediation. Previously, the minerals that were left in mine waste were considered economically unviable to extract, but declining ore quality concerns and future supply concerns are making responsible, sorry, are making reprocessing more appealing. For instance, if we look at the case of Chile, one of the world's largest copper producers, there is a significant amount of copper contained in mine waste, which has higher grades than primary resources, which is set to increase if current trends continue. In 2005, the amount of contained copper with higher grade than primary sources was 1.6 million tons, which is now uh, 2 million tons today and is set to rise further to 5.6 million tons by 2050. Realizing this potential will require comprehensive waste resource mapping supporting R&D for new recover, recovery technologies, providing economic incentives, and addressing legal liability barriers related to mine waste at abandoned sites. And I will now pass to my colleague, Amrita. So for the last portion of our presentation today, I'll be covering uh, the topics of business models as well as technology innovation and finally wrapping up with some conclusions and policy recommendations. So our analysis of indicative projects suggests that recycling businesses can be profitable, but energy transition minerals face a greater challenge in making profits than bulk materials. Market-based uh, battery metal recycling is particularly sensitive to the material price fluctuations that we've been seeing uh, recently in um, mineral markets. And this requires recyclers to have very robust balance sheets and working capital to weather the volatility in commodity cycles. For example, technologies with low residual material values, such as LFP battery recycling or rare earths recycling, might face greater challenges. And here, new business models like toll-based recycling and revenue sharing 
could offer recyclers an enhanced economic stability and encourage long-term investments. But beyond new business models, new technologies are equally important. Innovation holds promises for improving recycling efficiency. Current technologies often struggle with the complexity and diversity of products uh, containing critical minerals, resulting in lower recovery rates as well as material losses. Emerging technologies such as advanced sorting, novel chemical and physical processes, and new quality control methods can help overcome some of these challenges. We've seen positive trends for new technology development and um, with the example of lithium ion battery recycling uh, patents, which grew at an average annual rate of about 56% between 2017 to 2022. And we also saw venture capital investments uh, in battery and waste recycling surging recently. So policy incentives and collaborations to spur technology innovation will be essential to bring these promising technologies to market in a timely manner. Our report concludes with nine key policy recommendations which are aimed at overcoming the challenges and unlocking the potential of critical minerals recycling. I'd like to highlight just a few points here in the interest of time and I invite all of you to explore all the recommendations more deeply uh, in our report. So on recommendation six, which is uh, strengthening recycling systems in emerging and developing economies, uh, we've highlighted throughout the report that unregulated and untreated waste that might contain some critical and precious minerals, but also hazardous materials, have often found their way from advanced economies to emerging and developing economies. But looking beyond waste, several secondhand appliances, devices, and in particular vehicles, as was mentioned previously in our presentation, have also been shipped regularly to emerging and developing economies for reuse to extend their lifespan before they need to be recycled. Therefore, measures to prevent illegal waste exports um, and imports is the first step towards dealing with this issue, but secondhand products will still need to be recycled in these regions. And for this, it's crucial to have support from advanced economies to direct investments, not only towards scaling up recycling infrastructure and waste management systems, but also for skill and technology transfer to emerging and developing economies. Next, I'd like to mention briefly about uh, recommendation eight, which is about embracing a holistic approach beyond recycling. So while our report that we launched uh, earlier this week focuses mainly on recycling, we also recognize the need for a more comprehensive circular economy of which recycling is one part. So a truly sustainable approach to critical minerals value chains requires a broader perspective uh, that goes beyond recycling and starts with consumer demand management resource efficiency and circular product design. For end of life products and technologies, reuse, repurposing and refurbishment should be the first line of defense before recycling. Manufacturers should be incentivized to design products for, long for longevity, repairability and recyclability. This may entail regulations such as uh, eco design requirements or tax incentives for circular design. And moreover, efforts to create Awareness campaigns can play a crucial role in fostering a culture where consumers can better understand the environmental impacts of their choices. With that, we'd like to thank you for your attention and we open the floor for questions and I pass back to Tim and Tayun. Thank you so much, Amrita, and thank you very much uh, to Tayun and all the colleagues um, that presented. Uh, and thanks too to those that have already sent in, in questions. Please keep them coming in. We'll get through as many as we can before we start um, the, the panel. I think we have around 10 minutes. And the first one is a, a definitional question uh, which came in from Gurugam Singh. Um, the secondary production is defined, is, it's a question about is secondary def production defined recycling used uh, material or does it also include the scrap waste streams during primary production? Maybe to you and you can take that one. Yep. So when we define the secondary supply and we both include the recycled materials from end of life the equipment, but also include the, the material recovery from manufacturing scraps. So this is particularly important for batteries. For example, in the coming some several years and there's some lack of end of life, the battery feedstocks available, but there's a large amount of sizable amount of manufacturing scrap is being available from the battery manufacturing plant. So this 
at least in the short term until 2030. And this will be some important source of secondary supply the, in our view. So that is one of the reasons we included this manufacturing scrap in our definitions. But also, this is the same for rare earth elements. So in the permanent magnets, and we include both the end of life, the rare earth recovery from permanent magnet, but also we include some volumes recovered from the manufacturing for losses from this permanent magnet manufacturing processes. Thanks very much to you. Plenty of questions coming in, and we'll take the next one um, from Jinka Kale. For on the, similar to other critical minerals, could you also talk about silicon? How will recycling silicon from solar panels help reduce emissions and meet solar manufacturing demand globally? Um, maybe Eric, would you like to take this one? Thanks a lot for this question. So um, we see a number of projects emerging to recycle solar PV. So this is good news. This is true in regions where solar PV recycling is actually incentivized. But it is also true in regions um, which, where this is not the case, suggesting that there's at least some business case uh, market driven to recycle solar PV. Um, however, what we also noticed is that a number of those projects focus on recycling copper and silver and not always the high purity silicon they contain. So this is regrettable for two reasons. First of all, because high purity silicon requires a lot of energy to produce but also because it's characterized by a very high level of supply concentration. So there might be a bit of a gap between pure market incentives and then the environmental and strategic dimension of recycling there. Um, one of the possible answers to that is to consider material specific targets and transparency. Great, thanks very much, um, Eric. Um, I'll take the next two questions together. There was a question from Juan Pablo Madonis on what role do you think circularity can realistically play in the current ongoing race for critical minerals? And then there was another one from Kevin Brigden. A number of recent reports have highlighted the substantial potential for reducing demand, such as a shift in transport away from EV car use to public transport. Did the study consider this and how can it alter the fraction of demand that can be met via recycling? And I think perhaps you and Amrita might uh, combine to provide some answers to that one. Yep. So I think the in terms of the contribution of recycling in addressing these critical mineral challenges, and we need to look at the both short term and some medium to longer term pictures. In the short term, their contribution might be a bit limited because there's some not much amount of end of life period stock available for battery metals. Although some cases like copper and this is already large amount of recycling available in the marketplace. But in the medium to longer term, we believe so recycling can make some very sizable contribution in reducing the, the, the development need for new mines and new cementers, and also can help the diversify our supply sources. So this, in our estimation, as I presented in the slide, and we by 2040 in our APS scenario, recycling can reduce the, the material, the, the mining need by some 25 to 40%. The, the ratio depending on, very depending on the minerals you're talking about, but the, this is a scale we are projecting in, in the longer term. But this 25 to 40% can be interpreted in many ways. This is very sizable the contributions, but also they don't the eliminate the need for new investment, new mines and new smelters and new refineries, especially the, in the case, in the context, we need to build some more diverse by facilities in the world. So, so those, those two contexts should be taken into account. Thanks very much, um, Amrita. Yes, on the question of uh, other measures to reduce demand, um, of course, our report right now focuses on recycling, but in the broader work that is done on the World Energy Outlook team uh, that we're all uh, a part of, there is a, a transport team that focuses also on modeling um, the impacts of behavior change. And um, these aspects of modeling are also fed into the critical minerals model. So uh, behavior change can include uh, several aspects, such as choosing more uh, active uh, as well as public forms of transport, but also the right sizing of, uh, of cars and uh, therefore also of uh, EV batteries that is selecting a more optimally sized vehicle uh, as well as a battery. So um, I can explain this a little bit more with the help of the example of lithium markets, where today's uh, announced supply projects are not in line uh, with meeting, meeting the demand for uh, required for clean energy technologies in 2030. So without additional measures, the lithium demand would need to grow about four and a half times uh, within the next uh, five years. 
And um, uh, however, the right sizing of uh, batteries, scaling up recycling, and continued investment in technology innovation for new battery chemistries uh, can together reduce the demand by about 25%, which saves an amount equivalent to today's global lithium production volumes. And with these reductions, the new supplies from uh, primary sources, uh, which is mining, would need to grow only by about 20% per year between uh, today and 2030. And the lithium industry has managed to deliver this scale of growth in recent years, which paints an optimistic picture for lithium supply uh, up to the next decade if we employ all possible measures that are uh, within our control. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Amrita. And a question came in on copper uh, from Constantin Vaughan, and I'm going to pass this one to, to Shobhan. Uh, um, according to your analysis, the primary production, uh, for example, for copper is supposed to level out from 2030 onwards in the APS. This seems very optimistic. What are your assumptions regarding collection and recycling efficiency rates to achieve these outcomes? And would it be possible to get access to documentation of the methodology you used? So, Shabhan, Shabhan. Yeah, thanks uh, for the question. So, um, indeed, the, uh, the the copper recycling is is set to, to grow rapidly in our APS scenario. So, currently, copper scrap availability is growing alongside consumption until 2030. But after 2030, it outpaces demand growth. So in the APS, scrap volumes before collection and processing losses increase from 16 million tonnes today to 19 million tonnes by 2030 and almost 30 million tonnes by 2050, which is equivalent to 70% of projected demand. And this is driven by particularly by the rapid growth of clean energy technology deployment and their eventual reaching end of life. Construction does remain the largest source of end-of-life copper scrap, but scrap from EVs and storage is set to grow the fastest, which is going to expand about 35-fold between 2030 and 2050. So enhancing collection rate, rates is critical to ramping up uh, copper recycling volumes, and we anticipate this is going to happen in the APS with the right policy incentives. Um, it is very possible, and lots of things are already taking place, uh, particularly for batteries which can can lead on to the collection for copper motors uh, motors in electric vehicles etc so enhancing copper collection rates is the most critical aspect to increasing uh, copper recycling rather than the yields which are already relatively high so um, and for, on documentation i'm very happy to give more information if you contact uh, if you're happy to email us um, i'll help happy to provide that thank you thanks very much um Indeed, Shobhan. I'll take some, some broad questions here. There's one from Andreas Stringetti. Um, one, do you know if the technologies needed for recycling are widespread and available, or is this an issue that needs to be addressed by companies and governments together? And perhaps, um, Gilbin, would you mind um, providing an answer there? Sure, very happy to take that. So we do have technologies available for critical minerals recycling, but many current technologies do struggle with the complexity and diversity of products coming into the uh, input uh, feedstock. So these result in lower recovery rates and material losses. And we think that emerging technologies like advanced sorting, novel methods uh, such as chemical and physical processes and new quality control methods can overcome these challenges. And to support this, we have seen an increase in technologies, uh, well, in patents for these sort of technologies. But at the same time, we think that policy support and collaborations between institutions at the private and public sectors should be more focused and targeted rather than being scattershot. Thanks very much indeed, Gubin. I think um, we are almost out of time for this. We'll take just a couple more questions before passing over to the uh, panel. There's a, a question from Aman Chitkara. Uh, I was delighted to see the need to evaluate the ESG impact of recycling as a recommendation. Could you speak more about your early thinking on this topic? Based on your research, what are the most concerning ESG impacts from recycling that should be addressed? And Alex, do you mind taking one? Thank you for your question, Anand. Um, as Tayun mentioned in his presentation, we can see that there are ESG benefits to recycled material over primary material, um, such as lower emissions, um, but there are also um, ESG implications for recycled material as well that need to be mitigated and addressed uh, when uh, policymakers are uh, making incentives to target, um, to target the scaling up of recycling. So some of these include uh, hazardous um, waste, which can come from recycling processes, 
Um, these can lead to environmental impacts, um, soil contamination, water pollution, um, but also impacts to human health. Um, we also see that in some areas of recycling, historically, there have been human rights concerns, for example, with the um, collection of e-waste, particularly with child labor. Um, and then, of course, there are also different types of processing pathways, and these have different implications for emissions and water use. And so all of these things need to be um, considered carefully when, um, when scaling up recycling to ensure that ESG impacts are minimized. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, some very, very good questions, which we're not going to be able to get to, um, but we will get back in touch with those posing the questions um, on a bilateral basis to answer them if we don't have the chance to, to cover them a bit uh, later on during this session. But I would like to take this last one um, from Siet uh, Omer Hasnan um, on the EVs ending up in developing countries in second-hand markets. So as significant quantities of products like EVs ending up, end up in developing countries in second-hand markets, what incentives can be provided to developing economies as most of these to-be-recycled products will reach their end of life in these developing economies? So Shobhan, would you like to take that one? Yeah, thank you for the question. And this is a key area of economic development opportunity for many developing economies. So First, clarity on the on the EV export rules is kind of needed, and that really gives investors confidence on where these end-of-life EVs will actually end up being scrapped and being available to recycle. And uh, this can provide a key opportunity that, you know, developed uh, advanced economies can, can support in. So technical assistance on development, foreign investment, direct investment, policy development banks can strategically support these recycling projects in the developing economies. Now, with batteries, there's two stages, the pretreatment capacity, which, a pretreatment stage, which is more about shredding the battery, that's more mechanical, break it down into black mass. And then there's the material recovery stage, which is the more complicated chemical recovery stage. Now, we believe pretreatment capacity is really well suited to uh, being developed in developing economies because it is less capital intensive, less technically complex. So... This could be the first areas of support that for particularly for end of life used EVs, which will could end up in significant volumes in these economies. And these could be the first place to be focused. Other aspects like collection activities and the logistics for transport of these waste batteries can also be invested in and encouraging foreign investment to then take these black mass to other places where they can the materials can be recovered. I think can be a, a large and significant area of economic development for these regions. That's great. Thanks a lot, um, Shobhan. Um, I think we'll we'll leave this session there. There's a lot of very, very good points uh, appearing on the chat function. Um, what I propose is that colleagues will now reply in the chat function to those um, um, to those questions where we haven't had the chance already to um, to answer them and just to say that the a recording of this webinar will also be available uh, to review um it'll be on the ia video channel which i understand is, is is on youtube but with that um many many thanks to our presenters many many thanks to the engagement from uh, our participants today uh, and i'm going to pass it across uh, to Tayun uh, to moderate uh, this excellent panel Thank you, Tim. So the second part of this webinar is to hear from the renowned expert in the recycling field. So we have uh, some excellent lineup of speakers. The first, we have a mix of policymakers, academia, and also the private companies working on this field. So we have a Constantia V from the European Commission who is leading this critical mineral policy in the, in the commissions. And secondly, we have a Kuna Sinha, the grand course, the head of the recycling, global head of recycling. And then we have Sinsuke Murakami, which is the, the professor of the University of Tokyo and in the Department of Technology Management and Innovations. And finally, we have a Mark Richard from the Rio Tinto, who is the general manager of international affairs and strategies. So I will invite this panelist to the turn on the video and then the come to the stage. And then how this second session can be learned. So we will the, do some two round of moderated questions to the panelists, and then we will open up the floor to the, the audience questions. So feel free to the, continue 
be putting your question in the chat function. So we will pick up those questions and, and, and address to the panelists. And when you put the questions in the Q&A chat, and then please indicate the panelists you want to address your questions to. So the, the <laughs> thanks for taking the time, the panelists, for joining this webinar. So at the first, the, we will start from the, the Shinsuke Murakami the, uh, the, about the question about technologies. So in the slide and also in the questions, we talk about some importance of technology innovation and in this scaling of recycling. But in today's landscape, what kind of technology gaps you see in the marketplace and how those technology gaps can be addressed to the promote the recycling, the infrastructure investment decisions? Uh, okay. Uh... I didn't expect that I'm the first one. So but anyway, uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, and regarding the question you make now is, you know, the first point is, you know, uh, especially in the case of Japan, you know, one of the issue is in you know, the collection and the transportation. But that's not the uh, long one. Uh, we also need to have the bigger size kind of sorting center. And, but uh, I'm, uh, a little bit curious that was if we have the sufficiently good technology to implement for those kind of you know large size sorting center. So for example, you know I believe you know we have a good technology for sensing recently. You know we have the uh, so many different type of sensor, and also we have the good technologies to analyze the obtained data from the sensing. Uh, such as, you know, using the AI technology, for example, but that's okay. Uh, but the issue is, you know, we I saw so many, you know, sorting center you know, employing this kind of technology, but the issue is, you know, you know, sensor can be, can sense, and the AI can analyze, but uh, then physically, you know, moving the scraps or something is quite difficult yet, for still. So maybe the issue, one of the issue could be the Robotics, I think, you know, the controller is okay, but the physically moving the, you know, things is, and, you know, huge challenges in the sorting part, I think. So that's one of the things I noticed. Yeah. Thank, thank you, since you mentioned about there are some development in, in sensing the sorting using some AI technology, technologies, but still there are some physical the separations, moving transport, there are some scope to further technology innovation. And then maybe Related to that question, I want to turn to Constantia B from the European Commission because the European Commission is putting a lot of effort in the promoting and supporting this technology innovation. So how the, has the European Union supported advanced the recycling technology development and what kind of some new tasks emerging in, in your the plate? Constantia, over to you. Thank you, Chen. Um So the European Commission has been ever since 2015, supporting the circular economy, probably even before that, but that was slightly before my time. Um, we first brought out our circular economy action plan in 2015, which already um, placed a lot of effort and um, focus on recycling. But of course, circular economy is a larger field, which does not only go towards recycling, um, but also towards other measures that are equally supported. Um, in terms of technology gap, what we, very, what we, for example, through our R and I budget Horizon Europe um, support, is uh, innovation in recycling technologies. There are, I think, ever since the start of this last program, which must have been twenty one, we have put towards. Um, recycling technologies and processing technologies about 250 million euros for research um, which do not only which also should be addressing for example the sorting um, of waste um, another big effort that we take in this is um, looking at certification and looking at um, standardization so that we can create a market for secondary raw material where the trust in the produced raw material is as high as in primary. Um, and another big venue where we see huge gains to be made is traceability of raw materials, especially when it comes to recycling, which we address, for example, with digital product passports um, or um, 
again, certification schemes. Thank, thank you, Constanji. So just not about supporting some the, some promising technology set, but also some effort on certification, traceability, and standardization on this front to create some efficient secondary market. That's interesting. So then I will turn to Mark from the Otinto about the some economics aspect. So how do the recycling economics look like today? And what Polish framework, in your view, can help to make recycling business model more commercially viable? And over to you. Thanks, Taeyun, and, and congratulations to the IEA for, for another great report um, in moving things forward in the, in the critical mineral space. Let me start with saying that, that Rio Tinto is a, a big supporter of the role of recycling in, in supplying different energy transition minerals and materials. Uh, we recently acquired a 50% uh, JV interest in the Metalco business, um, which has six different recycling facilities in the US and Canada, um, and the capacity to produce about 900,000 tonnes of, of recycled aluminium each year. We were already a, a global leader in aluminium with, with a large scale vertically integrated business from bauxite mines to alumina refineries to, to smelters producing um, aluminium that's certified as responsible. Um, but with this recycling interest, we can we can now provide a broader range of high quality and, and low carbon aluminium products, um, including products for which secondary aluminium is, is preferred. So this, this reflects how the, the recycling of different minerals and materials can differ one to another, um, whereas pr primary and recycled copper may be largely substitutable. Um, primary and, and recycled aluminium can be subject to different products and markets. Um, in, in terms of economics and policy, as the, the report highlights, uh, one of the biggest issues continues to be achieving scale and, and efficiency in the, in the collection and separation and, and processing of relevant minerals uh, in what is generally a, a relatively low margin business. This is also happening in the in an environment of, of greater consumption of minerals and materials. Um, so recycling rates today um, of, of minerals and materials that were mined decades ago needs to increase exponentially just to, to maintain, let alone increase the percentage of scrap material in new product um, that, that's being consumed today. Um, so recycling is a an important co um, important component in the in the supply of new materials. Um, it will require support to to better establish itself and grow, um, and we need to be realistic about its contribution um, to to current demand in in a world that is is using more and more materials. Um, you've already touched uh, on on different policy responses, but but just a, a couple that that come to mind. Um, export controls on scrap to to try and generate scale, uh, limits on on dumping of cheap primary product, given there's a relationship between the price of of primary and secondary materials, um, grants and taxes to to facilitate better recycling infrastructure and systems and and behaviors, um, and finally the you know there's the potential to uh, to introduce zero to, zero to landfill regulation to uh, um, to again try and facilitate or encourage that that better infrastructure systems and behaviours, um, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Yep, and thank you, Mark. There are some important keywords in in your the answers about this importance of scale and efficiency in supporting this relatively low margin business, but also importance of grant mm -hmm. incentives in addition to with some regulations to prevent the waste from ending up in landfills. And I think they maybe turn the same question to Kunal as well. So the, from the private company's point of view, what kind of challenges you face in terms of the, the recycling economics and what kind of signals from Polish Max can help boost industry and investment confidence in the lamp of recycling? Kunal, over to you. Thanks, Tim. Now, congrats on the report. I think it's fairly comprehensive and well researched. Um, look, I think from from a Glencore perspective, we've been recycling various um, 
end of life for most consumer, most manufacturing uh, feedstocks for almost uh, close to close to 80, 90 years now. Uh, copper for that period of time, e-waste for almost 50 years, batteries for more than 20 years. So I think for with that experience, I mean, first thing I would say is I believe you know, if if you if we look back at our experience, recycling is a highly profitable business. Um, I think it takes um, it's not an easy business, but I think if it's done well, it's it's highly profitable. Um, in fact, in some parts of some of the metals, on a on a unit uh, economics basis, the the recycling part of the business actually makes more money than the primary part of the business. Um, and I think it's how you you know structure. Um, these business models and sort of they evolved over time. Uh, I do see that you know, if you look at battery metals, it looks like that's called out in the report that uh, maybe the economics is uh, not as, as uh, is still being challenged a little bit versus let's say copper. But I think it's, you know, it's a question of uh, maturity of markets and then finding the right business models um, and addressing the right sort of risks in, in that in that in that model, so if we compare our businesses with each other, I think broadly we see all recycling businesses are quite similar, um, and the drivers of margin and profitability is also very similar. It's just managing the risks uh, like price risks, which is hedging, uh, counterparty risk, uh, payments, like just the same simple uh, hygiene of commodity trading applies to recycling, and as long as you can bring it. Uh, to that, we we find recycling to be a highly profitable business. In terms of policy measures, signals, I think it's it's um, it's it's very interesting. I think one difference, which I think the report very rightly calls out uh, in one of the sections, is um, if you see like there are regions of the world that are well endowed in terms of natural resources, and then there are regions of the world. Uh, that let's say don't have those natural resources, but have a lot of recycling stock. And it just so happens that that's a lot in the West where in Europe or North America, there are certain critical minerals where either we don't have enough or we're not mining fast enough, but that's where a lot of your uh, consumer products, cars, EVs, electronics, solar panels, the installed stock is. And so I think what's interesting is to understand from a policy perspective, from if you look at recycling, Things like um, faster, easier permitting of recycling facilities, something that was addressed in the uh, CRMA regulation by the European Commission. Um, there's certainly uh, benefits uh, from accessing cheaper financing, which of course uh, in the US IRA provided some of that. But beyond that, I also believe we should look at regulations around uh, or supportive regulations around uh, upstream collection an aggregation of uh, of this uh, this feedstock. Uh, Europe has a lot of success in this uh, in in terms of the V directive that was implemented about fifteen years ago and has been a huge success in terms of e waste collection rates. Something similar needs to happen for batteries. So there's battery directive, uh, but the same thinking needs to apply to let's say U.S. Canada. And then the last thing I would say is at the moment uh, the the supply chain for recycling these uh, post-consumer, post-manufacturing uh, resource streams is fairly global. I know that there's a huge push to localize it, and I, we are supportive, and I'm sure it will happen, but it can't happen overnight. So this very global supply chain requires trans-border movement of these materials. So that, I think, is a huge policy topic because um, there are the frameworks like Basel Convention, other frameworks, that are there for the right reason, and they but they were developed 50 years ago when I don't think circular economy was top of mind. If you look at the implementation of those frameworks today, it actually kind of clogs up the circular economy, slows it down, is becomes actually more expensive. So we just need to find new ways to keep those controls while also allowing these materials to flow to the right places where they can be recycled. So I think those would be the policy regulatory areas that would speed up more recycling, more circularity. Yep. So thank you, Kunal. <clears throat> this is very interesting. So very encouraging to hear this recycling is quite profitable. And then we also found that situation for the bulk materials such as aluminum and copper. Although 
the battery recycling may face some, some different dynamics depending on the material prices and others. But also so some important keyword about this important permitting and cheap financing, also regulation about upstream collection more and more clarity about this rules about this cross-border waste trade and the, the need to make it more kind of streamlined and more efficient to not to hamper the, the development market. So maybe in the second level questions and maybe can we can go a bit more specific to individual segment or regions. So first question again to the Sinsuke Murakami, the, about the, we talk about some big disparity between advanced economies and developing economies in terms of the recycling performance. So the how can the partnership between the countries with more advanced recycling industries then the, can support the technology development in recycling in developing emerging and developing economies. So how, what kind of the synergies can be made between these regions? Okay, thanks. And uh, the first thing we have to be careful is, you know, that uh, not exporting all the advanced technology to the develop, developing economies at once, you know. It's simply impossible, you know. We had so many bad experiences uh, in the last 10, 20 years, I think. You know, just simply, you know, bring the advanced technology like machinery or something to the developing world and that, you know, just becomes waste. You know, no one can manage it. So it's not a good idea. So that's one thing. And another thing is, you know, how to collaborate in between these, you know, two economies, you know. So uh, um, the first thing is, you know, maybe the difficult part should be done simply by the developed world. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, pre-treatment stages or separation stages can be done at the, you know, source of the end of life goods in, I mean, the developing economies. And also now what we can uh, collaborate is you know, we can also, you know, bring the software systems or information systems for the traceability or something. And also with uh, some kind of an you know, assessment technology, like maybe that life cycle assessment or, you know, other some, uh, how can I say, it? the circularity assessment or something, which may, you know, dramatically increase the values of the scraps, you know, collected in the developing economies. So those kind of, uh, how can I say, the software systems, not the hardware technologies are also important to be exported in the collaboration, I think. Yeah, yep. that's all for now. Yep, thanks, thank you, Sinsuke. So the, some, some important keyword here about some, the pre-treatment treatment facilities can be maybe more suitable for these developing economies, given the less technical complexity we mentioned in the report, and also some IT software systems also it's well noted. So. And next question is about the one of the center piece of the recycling about batteries. So the question to Kunal again. So Grandco has been working in battery recycling for some years. So what kind of lessons has the Grandco learned from its battery recycling business globally? And then another specific question is about we are seeing some rapid the changes in the chemistry mix in batteries. So what lies of lithium ion phosphate in the mix and also some bifurcation between high nickel and then lithium ion phosphate. So how this changing the chemistry mix and technology mix affect the future recycling dynamics in your view? Yeah, so I think, um, look, I think we started recycling batteries in the early 2000s when battery recycling wasn't supposed to considered to be a, uh, a sort of a you know a Silicon Valley loved you know startup environment, uh, and now it is, which is good. So we've seen a lot of changes, and there's lessons from from those changes. I think the most important one, which is not specific to batteries, it's it applies actually in our case. Uh, we've noticed it applies to all forms of recycling. You know, we we find recycling as an activity is has more parallels to commodity trading than to mining. Because you know when you're mining, you, you have a, a, a ore body where you have a reasonable uh, a probability of understanding how much copper or nickel or, or you know uh, iron or whatever. Like you know how much metal is in the ground, and and so the risks you manage are very different. When you're recycling, you are predominantly dealing with post-consumer or post-manufacturing scrap. Especially post-consumer is notoriously difficult to a collect and b define what you will get in the gate like every day. 
So the risks are very different. So what we've learned is to have a successful business, it's more important to understand the risks and manage them. Uh, of course, you have to keep an eye on revenue, but if you don't manage the risks well, the revenues can easily be, and the profit profitability can easily evaporate. And and the risks are things like, you know, as you mentioned, battery metal prices fluctuate to lock. So how do you manage price risk? You are you have physical price ma- you know mechanisms. You can hedge. You can you can look at whether there are various other mechanisms. So how do you do that? Uh, counterparty risks. Um, recycling as an activity still today is made up of mostly uh, in the upstream side of this business. A lot of small players. Um, other than if you are just manufacturing gigafactory scrap, which is different. Uh, so how do you manage counterparty risks? Um, and then also I think specific to battery metals. The technology has had to evolve and it's still evolving. So things like um, 10 years ago, people were not focused on lithium recovery or lithium uh, didn't factor into the profitability of recycling. Uh, And that changed about five years ago. Now lithium prices have come down again. Uh, So we'll see what it does. But lithium recovery is almost a inevitable um, conclusion. And and we have invested in that space and we are working on other, uh, looking at graphite, looking at other other uh, things you can extract from the same feedstock. So it's sort of a constantly learning process. You learn, you adapt. Um, it's, it's, and the last thing I would say on that is what we have learned again, there's a lot of questions on in the current battery metal environment, like why you know this doesn't look profitable and things like those. So my response typically is that, like, if you think about it, the, when you recycle a battery, it's a value stack. So if I have a battery pack, Maybe a few years ago, that battery pack had ten thousand dollars of value, and recycling is an activity. Where if I simplify it, it's a it's a as a business model. We just had to find a way to share that value between three players: the supplier of the feedstock, the recycler, and whoever will buy the recycled metals. Right now, when the battery metal prices are depressed, let's say that value stack has shrunk to five thousand. Right. So, what does that mean? Does it mean that nobody will recycle? Because if you if you just say that nothing else changes, Mr. Recycler, you must still recycle. The recycler, recycler may say it's not profitable. I don't, I don't want to do it. So do you think that activity doesn't happen? No, because people figure out a way to sh- share that uh, value stack. So what we've seen is uh, this concept of gate fees or tolling come up because the recycling still has to happen. So in this price environment, people have changed how they share that uh, value stack. And for example, in some cases, we get paid for these feeds because, especially from a manufacturer perspective, they have an obligation to make sure it does get properly recycled. And when the prices change again, again, that, that value share will change. So so those are some lessons. To your question about chemistries, yes. And I think, you know, from our perspective, recycling cannot dictate the battery chemistry that should dominate or or scale. That, that is a function of something else, which is, uh, covered in the report, like availability of raw materials, prices, technology. Recycling can only react to uh, what's coming. In an ideal world where we are more circular, like you will, the, the manufacturers will have discussions with recyclers ahead of time. So we can have some some ideas. We're doing some work on solid state recycling, for example. So I think LFP specifically is a big part of the values uh, chain now in the energy storage and energy uh, systems. It's likely, as you're projecting, about 40% share could be even higher. So what it comes down to is like the same lessons we learned from, you know, uh, starting from LCOs to NMCs to various mixes of high, high nickel, we've adapted and we have processes where we can we can address, like, for example, lithium recovery now looking at graphite. I think the same evolution will, look, will go towards LFP. And LFP can be profitable because, but you just have to approach it that way, which is the value in an LFP pack is mostly in the lithium and iron phosphate. And so how do you have processes that can, you know, extract lithium at the highest efficiency possible? And how how can you upgrade that iron phosphate or find a high value use for it? And we see some promising work being done. We've certainly done some of our own work. We've fired some patents and we're looking at other university research where uh, they have done some good work on on that, specifically for LFP, and some of our investment companies have also done well in LFP recycling. So, but like five years from now, ten years from now, there might be a different chemistry. So, it's a sort of a constant wave. Like you have to catch the next wave and and find ways to solve for it. That that's been our approach. 
So thank you, Kunal. It's very interesting that the, it has been some constant phase of learning and, and some improving and how to share the value stack and others. And also you see some potential that kind of innovation and learning cycle could be applied to the lithium ion phosphate LP chemistry as well. So that is interesting. So next question is to, to Mark. And because the Leo Tinto is one of the frontier companies in the some trying to extract the value from mine waste and tailings. So it's a lot of interest about these topics. So the what kind of challenges you feel when this doing this effort and how policy makers can help to encourage the this development of this extracting value from this mine waste and tailings and, and from the closed site or abandoned site. And also question from the, the audience is about some Leo Tinto's work on reworking on tailings. And so could you explain a bit more about Leo Tinto's activities and some challenges and opportunities you face? Sure, thank, thanks, Dae Yun. So I think there's two issues here. There's there's full value mining and, and processing. And and secondly, there's there's remining at, at previously closed sites. So for full value mining and processing, there's a real opportunity to use existing ores, waste streams and, and processing infrastructure to extract as many minerals as possible. So for example, once, once permits have been obtained for an existing site, it, it's usually easier to do other similar activities on the same site without going through new permitting processes. Um, once processing infrastructure has been built, the, the marginal cost of adding new circuits to extract other minerals can be, be relatively small. Um, once ores have been extracted and crushed and, and put into a soluble form, it, including as a waste stream, it, it's relatively inexpensive from an OPEX perspective to extract additional, additional minerals. Um, and then finally, you know, extracting more from these existing sites and activities means, you know, the industry needs to open less new mines um, and produce less, less new waste, um, which, which helps with the, the social license for the industry as a whole. Uh, in this space, or there was a question around uh, what's, what's Rio Tinto doing in, in this space, um, we've got some great examples um, where we're producing a, a high quality scandium oxide um, from waste streams from our titanium dioxide production in Quebec, um, where we're now capable of supplying about 20% of the, of the global scandium market. Um, another example is, is we, we co-produce tellurium uh, from, uh, from waste streams at our, our Kennecott copper mine in the U S. Um, so, uh, yeah. both of these were, uh, additional circuits put onto, um, existing processes after the event. Uh, so I think sort of one of the learnings was that, um, had we, had we had the mindset or the interest in producing these, these other minerals and metals, um, when we first developed this, this infrastructure and the systems, then uh, then we might have been able to do in a in a more efficient way. Um, so there's a you know going forward, I think having a, a different mindset at the start of or um, when a, when upfront work in in design and construction is being doing can can make this a lot easier. Um, policymakers can also encourage this sort of activity uh, at the outset of new mines or or during that that design phase or permitting phase to to be interested in um, in whether or not there are other minerals that can be produced and 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 ask questions of of developers, and also promote good practices in this space, um, which uh, which will sort of encourage more of this activity and uh, and support the license to operate for for those uh, undertaking these these um, positive cool. activities. For for remining at, at previously closed sites. Um, it can be interesting to look at, at a possible life cycle of a mine. So for large resources, you usually get larger companies uh, involved with the early mining. They often require higher returns in order to warrant their participation and, and their large investments. Um, when mining becomes marginal for those, those companies, the, the resource may transfer to a, a smaller company, uh, which, which brings you know, potentially smaller investments and uh, acceptance of smaller returns. And this can continue until you might ultimately get an NGO involved who is prepared to accept some of its return in, in the form of social returns. So it's, it's an example to show that not all waste is, is equal. 
uh, and that different types of players can be involved in the in the mining and and remining of a of a resource over time. Uh, from a policy perspective, um, it's it's really great if uh, if policymakers can help map potential sources of of uh, of waste and and minerals. Um, an example of that's the Australian Atlas of of mine waste. Uh, and they can also consider legislation such as, as the Good Samaritan legislation in parts of the US that, that facilitates the, the remining or repurposing um, by exempting new players from legacy liability, uh, liabilities. Um, so that can help facilitate access to resources by appropriate players, um, but obviously bearing in mind there's a, a balancing of, of different objectives um, that's needed here. Um, one example in, in terms of Rio Tinto, one example to, to look at is um, we are in a, a joint venture with um, an NGO called Resolve. Um, the, the joint venture is called Regeneration. Um, and that's a partnership where we um, are working with them to look at opportunities to extract critical minerals from, um, from closed mine sites, uh, whereby the, the value of some of the critical minerals um, to be extracted would, would help support in the cost of um, of re rehabilitating these um, these historic mine sites. But, um, I'll leave it there. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Mark. It's very interesting. So we see some some growing the interest about this remining and mine history. And some you highlight this importance of up, some upfront mindset and also some pay attention to design pace to think about some some potential the the resource recovery at the end of the life cycle. And also we also hear some not all mine waste that we call. So there are some different types and so some different players might be very suitable. So the facilitating some some good partnerships between the 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 previous owners and some new companies want to chip in and that might be beneficial. So that is very interesting. And final the moderated question now to go to Constanji about because we highlight in the Amnita presented in the recycling is one part of the whole the circularity measures. There are some other opportunities projects such as the more product design or reuse or extending lifetime of the equipment through repair, refurbishment. So in your view, what the, how do you see about this broader, the circular economy opportunities and what kind of efforts the European Union is doing on, on this front? So um, I see great benefit in the circular economy used to the full with all of the measures that are um, part of the circular economy that are part of the waste pyramid. So before you should recycle, you should reuse, you should uh, repair, you should reduce. Um, all of these are measures that can be taken under the circular economy. And all of these can be supported under the circular economy. And all of these are, I'm not going to call them no regrets options, but certainly options that will help us um, create better security when it comes to critical raw materials. And it will help us create um, more um, retention of value in the economies, in the global economy, for example, too. Um, so when it comes to um, European policy, um, on the circular economy. It is one of the priorities of the new incoming um, European Commission. Um, and it has been a focal point, as I already mentioned, for quite some time. Um, measures that we use to support uh, the circular economy are, for example, uh, our eco design directive, recently um, renamed to. Um, Eco design for sustainable eco design for sustainable products regulation, um, which came into force this summer, um, which also entails measures on durability of products, so you can use them longer, on repairability of products. So you have this is a different directive, but it also came to force into this year. Uh, you have a right to have you have a right to get a product repaired for um, an acceptable or decent price, less than what the uh, what a new one would be, which is, I think, a great thing because the amount of um, products that I have 
uh, thrown away because I couldn't get them repaired and it was cheaper to buy a new one is tremendous considering uh, that I am only one person and I'm quite diligent with my stuff. Um, but if you kind of see that on a societal scale, that is uh, a large amount of waste. Um, this focuses initially more on high impact products like steel and aluminium. We see that there is need to increase the collection and recycling of this. Um, but also what is part of this process is uh, digital product passports and consumer information on what their products actually entail. Also information to recyclers so that they are able to recycle products in the right way and see what the value in this product actually is. Um, we also, in the Critical Raw Materials Act, which do, does not have, which has a chapter on recycling and sustainability and circular economy, but many of these things are already legislated in our waste legislation frameworks. Um, but we, for example, foresee labeling requirements for permanent magnets because we foresee that a large amount of permanent magnets will become available with wind turbines and the uptake of EVs at the end of their life cycle. We need to be prepared for what is to come. Um, under the Critical Raw Materials Act, for example, we also um, ask member states to uh, devise national schemes that increase the circularity in their economy, as well as we as looking at extractive waste and remediation and revalorization of the extractive waste that we actually have available in Europe. Um, to mention, because it has been mentioned many times before, um, we have a relatively large waste framework legislation that also governs uh, waste streams such as end-of-life vehicles, waste batteries or uh, electric and electronic products. And all of these help increasing the circularity, not just of the products, but also, well, not just of the waste, but also retaining the value of this waste um, or retaining the value of the materials that are now considered waste. And this would kind of be my last point to be made on this from a policy perspective. Um, it is very opportune and apt to start reconsidering what is defined as waste and what is defined as resource and to uh, create legislation that supports this rethinking of um, matters. Thank you. So thank you, Costanja. It's very interesting and encouraging to hear some a lot of this effort by the European the Union on this front about eco design and right to repair, and also very important point about this clear definition about the waste versus resources. How to in what conditions we can declassify this as a resources and in waste it can be waste, and that's an interesting point to mention. So now we will turn to some audience questions. We have some very little amount of time left but i will take some some one two question from the audience so one question from nicola to kunal so you mentioned about economics of recycling so copper and, and others is quite profitable at this moment but to what degree you see some differences between the regions so in some regions it's become economical but in other regions and maybe it may not be the case so do you some shed light on the the regional differences between in terms of economics and also the, to what extent the ESG, the regulations, and, and can impact these economics. And in relation to the, there are some, some discussion about some incentivizing recycle with some good performance. So how we can define some good recyclers with some high ESG performance in, in your view? So could you can combine these questions? Yeah, I think, um, look, thanks, um, it's a good question. I mean, profitability is a direct, uh, result of many things, but definitely cost. Um, there is processing costs. There is obviously cost for complying with various environmental regulations in various regions, um, and those those are hugely sort of varying across the world. Uh, also, I think profitability sort of any activity is also a function of scale. So some parts of the world, I think, you know, if you look at just the the stock of batteries to be recycled is 
is is quite huge in in let's say countries like China. The scale is very high, um, and they have been doing it for a quite long time. So I think you can see the profitability there would be different for other parts of the world where that scaling is only currently happening. So you you could sort certainly see that. Um, I don't think fundamentally, you know, done well. There's going to be other than the fact that certain uh, input co- functions like labor cost reagents can be cheaper in certain parts of the world versus other parts of the world. Uh, other than those sort of predictable factors, there's uh, maybe I don't, I don't see sort of huge uh, differences in profitability. Uh, to your question about what makes a good recycler, I think as any business function, the, the most important uh, attribute is through the cycle, it should be highly profitable business. So I think what makes a good recycler is somebody who uh, can be highly profitable while also maintaining very high standards of environmental and, and labor compliance, uh, but also be very flexible uh, and innovative. And why that's important is what you get to recycle will keep changing. And it's not like even 10 year cycles, things change even every year. So, you know, if you are a very rigid, uh, if you are a very rigid business model and or a very rigid technical flow sheet, it's going to be hard to survive in recycling. So I think that's also a very important attribute. And why I mentioned innovation is you have to always push yourself constantly to extract more from the same uh, value stream that you're getting. So if you take the case of the battery industry, I think classic case, you know, we were focused mostly on nickel cobalt. I think now lithium is well understood. Graphite is next. You know, questions are being asked about silicon from solar panel. We do a lot of solar panel recycling. Those questions are being asked. Copper and silver has been figured out in solar panels. Glass is being remanufactured, but uh, going to uh, semiconductor grade silicon is sort of the next frontier. So I think that's the last thing as a good recycler over long term you need innovation both in business model, but also technology to always handle changing feedstock and to always extract more. Um, Because the last thing I may say on this is, if you look at a particular product you're trying to recycle, whether it's a solar panel, a car, a battery, a phone, it's not made up of the three metals that we all read about. It's made up of hundreds of materials and metals. So eventually, if somebody can extract more than just the three key base metals we hear about and that's all money right? um, and that's less going to landfill and you extract more dollars out of it so that's the journey of a good recycler in my opinion thank you Kuna. so we are running out of time so we will just do from one final question for the panelists and then we will wrap up so one final question is to Constanze B I think so there's some question about some lot of the and the traceability mechanisms and also standard and certifications, what role they can play to boost the consumption of the recycled materials. So what do you constant? Um, I think this would also be an interesting questions, question for actually our um, industrial actors that we have in this. So maybe maybe Glencore and uh, wants to take this afterwards. I think that would be also yeah. interesting to hear what they say. Um, so for me, the uh, role of standards, of transparency, of um, product kind of um, identification is that it actually enables a better market for secondary raw materials, not just when it comes to the sorting, because sorting is one of the areas where we lose most of the raw materials. It is the biggest factor in uh, how good recycling works, whether or not collection and sorting works. Um, but sorting is for that is, is a huge boon. It is a huge boon for the recycler to know what they're actually looking at. Um, it is very relevant then also to be able to say afterwards, this product comes from recycled raw materials which will help fulfill, for example, um, provisions as we have in the batteries and waste batteries directive on recycled content. And it will allow us in the future to actually enable um, the secondary market 
more rapidly through the fact that we can actually say that we can actually require a certain amount of recycled content and also be sure that this is recycled content. So for us, there is kind of a feedback loop that will enable the, um, the market for secondary raw material through creating traceability and transparency. Yeah. So thank you, Kostanji. So maybe other panelists, and if you have something to add, and please. Maybe I'll just say I just support what Constance just said. I think, uh, look, I mean, we can only respond to market forces and sort of regulatory forces as a sort of private sector. Um, I always look at what has worked in other places and how you can learn. So if you look and I go back to, if you look at, especially Europe, if you look at e-waste, um, the, you know, uh, the, the, the V directive has been a huge success in, uh, helping the private sector invest more in but in e-waste recycling, right? And if you think about it, the e the V directive does not require recycled content, so it's not a sort of a circularity sort of focus. It's very linear. If you look at battery directive, it does take it a step forward and requires recycled content. So we can debate whether that is like on this side of the pond when the U.S. people are hesitant to regulate so much. Uh, Europe has. Uh, sort of taken a lead in, in some of these ways. It is, in the end, um, hugely uh, beneficial from a recycling industry perspective um, to have these standards, to have traceability, um, and to have uh, some requirements for recycled content. Um, and again, that's a policy decision different regions are making. All I'm saying is those policy decisions are, are usually supportive for investment cases and for scaling up recycling and circularity. Yep. Thank you, Kuna. So given the, the amount of time we left, and I will close this panel session at the moment. So thank you for taking the time to share your insight. That's very excellent. So thank you again. And then I will turn to Tim to, to close the, the session. Well, thank you very much, and to Yoon, and thanks very much to, for that excellent panel discussion. Um, there's an awful lot for us uh, to digest. Um, there's been a very active uh, discussion also in the in the chat function, which uh, we'll try and wrap up as much as we can. Um, but I did want just to say thanks very much to to Yoon and the and the Critical Minerals Analytical Team here, um, but also to everyone who was able to join us today. Um, there's plenty more to say on this topic, and we look forward to discussing it with you on future occasions. Many, many thanks.